This is lecture 35, and today we will be talking about Gibbs free energy. Before we get into Gibbs free energy, we're actually going to cover one last topic associated with entropy. It's not big enough to get its own lecture, so we've got to kind of squeeze it in here. And that topic is reversible processes. So a reversible process is defined as this process that can be run in the reverse direction in such a way that once the system has been restored to its original state, no net energy is flowed either to the system or to its surroundings. In other words, a reversible process is just one where we can, once something's happened, we can kind of wind the clock back, turn it to its original state, and it'll look like nothing's happened. Obviously, not everything is a reversible process. Burning wood is not a reversible process. However, things like melting ice are reversible processes, where you can take a cube of ice and you can add some heat to it so that it becomes a liquid. But if you take that same amount of heat back, it turns back into ice. And so another condition of a reversal, reversible process is actually uh, very associated with that melting ice thing. A, rever a reversible process is a process that can be run so slowly that it is always at equilibrium throughout the chain. A great example right then is phase changes. Because if you have a block of ice, let's say you add half the heat needed to melt the block of ice, well then you've turned half of the ice into liquid water, and at that point you have an equilibrium between ice and water. You add a little bit more heat, you do this, let's say you start with the whole ice and you add heat really slowly, at any point there there's an equilibrium between ice and water. And in these reversible reactions, you can actually calculate your entropy really well, really simply. Your change in entropy in this is just going to be equal to the heat that's being added divided by the temperature you have. And let me give you a, an example of this. We're going to do, we're going to use ice for everything on this. Well, let's say you have ice and it takes 6.01 kilojoules of heat to melt one mole of ice at zero degrees Celsius. In other words, the enthalpy of fusion of ice is 6.01 kilojoules per mole. What is the delta S of my system for this phase change? How much are we increasing the entropy? Well, the entropy is just increasing proportional to the heat added divided by the temperature you're at. In this case, the heat we're adding, this 6.01 kilojoules, is just equal to the molar enthalpy of fusion for ice. It's just this. 6.01 kilojoules per mole, since we're dealing with just one mole. In other words, that's 6,010 joules. Now, what temperature are we going to be at? Well, you'll notice the question asks for this, or gives us the temperature in degrees Celsius. But for this type of calculation, the temperature has to be in Kelvin. Otherwise, you're going to get a really wrong answer. So we'll put the temperature in Kelvin, and we'll find that our delta S for our system is 22 joules per Kelvin meaning this is the amount that we increase the disorder in that system. Now let's ask the other question that's associated with this, and that's specifically, if we've changed the enthalpy, or sorry, the entropy of our system, what have we done to the entropy of our surroundings? Well, if the ice above is melting at zero degrees Celsius and a room maintained at 25 degrees Celsius, what would be the delta S for the surroundings? Well, our delta S of our surroundings is still going to be equal to the heat change for our surroundings divided by our temperature. And you know that the heat loss or gain of the surroundings is just going to be equal but opposite to that of the system. So in this case, our Q of our surroundings is going to be equal to the negative Q of our system, which is equal to the negative delta H of our fusion price here. So you might think that the delta S of our surroundings is going to be the exact same as our system, but you'll notice we're working at a different temperature. We're actually working at a slightly higher temperature, 298.1 Kelvin. So if I take that delta H of fusion, divide it by this temperature, you'll notice that our surroundings only lost negative 20.2 joules per Kelvin of order. So in other words, their surroundings became slightly more ordered but the surroundings became slightly more ordered, less than the system became more disordered. So if we check here, 22 plus negative 20.2 would give us 1.8 joules per Kelvin. That's how much 
the universe increased in disorder during this process. So that's actually it for uh, these reversible processes. Now we'll get into Gibbs free energy. And to start the conversation in Gibbs free energy, we always have to start by talking about spontaneity. Now in spontaneity, in, in everyday lingo, when we think of spontaneity, we think of things just happening kind of at random, out of the blue. Now that's not what we mean by spontaneity in chemistry. Spontaneity in chemistry has a very specific definition. A spontaneous process is a process that once you start it, continues to occur without outside intervention. So for example, let's say I have a bunch of matches uh, in a pot. Matches will spontaneously burn. That doesn't mean that if I have a bunch of matches in a bowl, they'll just randomly catch on fire and burn. What that means is if I throw a lit match into a bowl of matches, those matches will just continue to burn without me driving the reaction or doing anything. Now a cake, on the other hand, can is a, is a process that can either be non-spontaneous or spontaneous. For example, if I mix all the ingredients of a cake together in a mixing bowl and just leave them on my counter, they will never turn into a cake, right? So if I put that cake batter, though, into a a cake tray or cake pan, put it in the oven, and the heat in the oven will then cause the cake to, to bake. So in that case, we're driving this process. So at a higher temperature, this cake bakes spontaneously. At a lower temperature, it doesn't, right? So how can we predict whether our reaction is spontaneous or not? Well, it turns out that the enthalpy and the entropy will give us the answer here. We're going to use both the enthalpy and the entropy to calculate a new value called our Gibbs free energy. And the Gibbs free energy will tell us whether a process is spontaneous or not, or whether we have to add heat or not. So we'll start just with the equation for the Gibbs free energy. And then we'll talk more about what it means and how to interpret it. So the equation is just this. The change in Gibbs free energy of a process or reaction is just equal to the change in enthalpy of that reaction minus the temperature times the change in entropy. So you'll notice that there's just three things going on here. We're talking about the heat, whether this is exothermic or endothermic, the temperature this is happening, and how much it changes the disorder of the universe. All right, now we'll start with how to interpret results. If you plug in values for delta HT and delta S and you get a negative value, for your Gibbs free energy, that means you found a spontaneous reaction. If you get a positive value for your Gibbs free energy, that means the process you're looking at is not spontaneous. And often it means that the reverse process is spontaneous. So for example, um, if I have salt dissolved in water and I calculate what's its delta G value for Spon or for spontaneously turning into a solid and falling out of the liquid, well, then that process is going to have a positive delta G, right? Salt doesn't spontaneously come together and fall out of the liquid unless, of course, you add too much. Um, but if you add a solid uh, chunk of salt into liquid, it will spontaneously dissolve. So a positive delta G value means you're not spontaneous and often means the reverse process of what you're looking at would be spontaneous. Now what happens if you get a delta G value right at zero? Well, that's kind of like flipping a penny into the air and having it land on its side, right? It doesn't happen very often, but it does happen. And typically we interpret that to mean a system is at equilibrium, right? So this is our, our ice with some heat in it melting. So we have some liquid, some ice. Um, the ice isn't spontaneously turning into liquid. The liquid's not spontaneously turning into ice. They're living in this harmony state. Now let's get more into this equation though, and let's talk about what Gibbs free energy actually means and why it gives us this result of spontaneous and not spontaneous. So this was actually developed, this equation, by J. Willard Gibbs, who was actually the first person to get a PhD in the United States. So other Americans had gone to Europe to get PhDs, but he was the first one to actually earn his PhD in America. And he got his degree from Yale. Now, what did he mean by this equation? What does delta G mean? 
Well, let's start by looking at our part here. So delta H here is our total energy of the system or the total energy being exchanged during the process, right? We generally think about it as heat. It also has some accounting for work in it. Then our T delta S here represents the portion of this total energy that's being converted to entropy. So it turns out anytime we do a process or anytime we do a reaction, anything like this, we don't get all of that energy out the way we want. We always lose some to disorder or to other forces. And so this T delta S is a measure of energy that's lost basically to other things. So it's the portion of energy that doesn't do anything useful. We can then think of delta G as the energy that's left available to do useful work, right? It is the free energy that's left over during the process. And so uh, if you have energy available to do useful work, you can get this to go forward, right? So a negative delta G would mean that your system has extra energy left over to do something. And this extra energy can then drive this spontaneous process. If delta G is positive, that means your system needs more energy for this, for this process to happen, right? It means your system needs to take in energy, which means there's no free energy left over to do any work. So you're not going to get a spontaneous process. You're going to run into a wall. Oh, okay. Now, the nice thing about this equation, too, is it helps us predict when endothermic and exothermic reactions are going to be spontaneous. And it helps us to understand why some endothermic processes and some exothermic processes are spontaneous, while other ones are not. All right, so let's look at this in a little more detail. So our delta H value and our delta S value, they can have one of two conditions. So your delta H can either be positive or negative, and your delta S can either be positive or negative. And that gives us actually a total of four scenarios. We got delta H being negative, delta S being positive, delta H being negative, delta S being negative, etc. right? So let's think through what this would mean if we have these different signs for our delta H's and delta S's. Well, if delta H is negative and delta S is positive, well, then that's going to be a negative minus a positive number. So that's going to basically be a negative, getting more negative. So your delta G value is always going to be less than zero. If you have a delta H that's negative, which is an exothermic process, and a delta S that's positive, where you're increasing the disorder of the universe, right? Those are both the great things that reactions want to do. So this is going to be spontaneous at all temperatures, a reaction like this. What happens though, if you have an exothermic reaction, that decreases the disorder in your system. Well, in that case, you have a negative delta H minus a negative T delta S. So a negative minus a negative is the same as a negative plus a positive. So if you have a negative plus a positive, is that going to be a positive or a negative value for delta G? Well, it depends on which is bigger, your delta H or your T delta S. So in this scenario, you're only going to get a delta G value that's negative when you have a low temperature. Why is that? Well, if delta H is negative and T delta S is negative, right? Then T delta S, when T delta S gets bigger than delta H, then a negative minus a really big negative becomes a positive number. But T delta S can change in size by just changing the temperature. If you drop the temperature really low, then T delta S becomes really small and you get a negative number plus a really small positive number, you still get a negative delta G value. So this would be spontaneous just at lower temperatures. What happens then if they're both positive, delta H and delta S? Well, your delta H being positive isn't favorable, but your delta S having an increased disorder of your reaction, that is favorable. So in this case, a positive minus a positive is going to be a negative only when this second value is bigger than the first. So that gets bigger than the first when the temperature is really high. So if T delta S, if the temperature is really high, your delta G value is going to be negative. So this is going to be less than zero only at higher temperatures. This is only going to be spontaneous at higher temperatures.
Now, what happens in this last scenario where delta H is positive, that means we have an endothermic reaction and your delta S is negative, meaning you're decreasing the disorder in your system. Well, then that's a positive minus a negative. So basically a positive plus a positive, always going to give you a positive number. So your delta G is always going to be greater than zero. That means that this would never be a spontaneous reaction. So we've got two sets here. We've got the minus plus scenario where we're always spontaneous and the plus minus when we're never spontaneous. But then we have these middle guys that have what we call a crossover temperature, a point where it either goes from being non-spontaneous to spontaneous or spontaneous to non-spontaneous. Let's talk about that and look a little bit about or a little bit at what that means or what that looks like. We'll start again with ice here. So let's say ice wants to melt. Well, the delta H for that is going to be positive. You're going to have to put a heat into the ice to get it to melt. And the delta S is also going to be positive because we're going from a structured solid to a more chaotic liquid. So you're going to be increasing your entropy of the universe there and of your system. Let me throw up a plot here so we can kind of think how this is going to work. On this plot, I've got temperature on the x-axis. I've got energy on the y-axis. Now your delta H, right, that's a constant value. It's denoted here with this green line. It's a constant energy at any temperature. And actually, delta S is a constant at any temperature as well, but we're multiplying it by the temperature. So the temperature times um, a constant is just a variable value, right? So that's denoted with this purple line. So as we crank up the temperature, we increase this uh, T delta S line to a point where it at one point uh, intersects this delta H value. Now below that intersection point, we're going to have delta H minus T delta S. And since T delta S is going to be lower than delta H, our delta G value in this region is going to be a positive value. So in this region, we're not getting any spontaneity. Once we hit this point, though, where our delta H is equal in size to our T delta S, that's where our delta G is going to be zero. And if we keep going beyond that, where our T delta S is bigger than delta H, then delta H minus T delta S is going to be a negative value. So delta G for this type of reaction is only going to be negative above a certain temperature where our T delta S is greater than our delta H. What this means then is the only way to know if a reaction is spontaneous at a certain temperature especially if it's a reaction we're unfamiliar with, is to calculate delta G at that temperature. Of course, if you know the crossover temperature, like if you know what temperature water boils at, you know whether water boiling is spontaneous at one temperature or not. Let me give you a little practice here. For a reaction that is always non-spontaneous, that is where delta G is positive at all temperatures, what are the signs of delta H of our system and the delta S of our system. Go ahead and pause the video and try and figure this out. All right, well, we've got delta G equal to delta H minus T delta S, right? So if this is going to be positive at all temperatures, that means our delta H is going to be going to have to be positive, and we're going to have to subtract a negative number. So that would be the same as a positive plus a, plus a positive. And so for this to always be non-spontaneous at all temperatures, you have to get answer A then. Where your delta H is positive, your delta S is negative. All right, for the condensation of steam, I want you now to try and predict the sign for delta H and delta S. I don't want you to consult appendix four for this. I want you to try and do this on your own. Okay, we're going from steam to liquid water. Go ahead and pause the video and try and figure this out. All right, what would our delta H be? Well, our steam must lose heat in order to condense, right? It has to cool off. So that means that our delta H value, we're going to be losing heat, so delta H is going to be negative. And for our delta S, well, it's going from a chaotic gas state to a more orderly liquid state, so our delta S is going to be negative. We're going to be losing chaos. So in this case, we've got a negative heat and a negative delta S, the answer would be D. Let's give you one more of these. Based on this idea where delta H is negative and delta S is negative, 
the condensation of steam is spontaneous at what temperatures? Try and pause this and try and figure this out. All right, well, if our delta H is negative, our delta S is also negative. This is a negative minus a negative. That's basically the same as a negative plus a positive. So that means that our delta H uh, is going to be the thing we want to be bigger for this to be spontaneous. If T gets bigger, then T delta S gets bigger. If T delta S gets too big, it's going to overpower our delta H, which means that we'll be non spontaneous. So this is only going to work when temperature is low. So our T delta S value is low. Now, at what temperature does it become spontaneous specifically? Well, we're going to consider it at the point of when delta G equals zero. Now, in reality, the real point is just any amount below zero, right? So a delta G of negative 0 0.0000001 uh, would also count as spontaneous. Uh, we always just kind of make it simple and say it's going to become spontaneous approximately when delta G is equal to zero. Now, if we look at that, that means that delta H minus T delta S is going to be equal to zero. And this equation means that our delta H, right, will be equal to our T delta S. So if we want to find the temperature at which something becomes spontaneous, we can just solve this for T, and that would be equal to our delta H divided by our delta S. And that'll tell us the temperature at which a process becomes spontaneous. Now let's go ahead and work on calculating, calculating sorry, our delta G for our reaction. So we've already kind of seen one way where if we have the delta H of a reaction and the delta S of a reaction, and we know the temperature, we can just calculate it using this delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. But you can also calculate it a different way. You can actually use Hess's law and calculate the enthalpies of formation for all of these reactions, right? Now I'm not gonna do this, I'm not gonna write out all this process here, but I'm gonna take the heats of formation for each of these, add up the products, subtract the reactants, and I'd get a delta H of the reaction, 63.6 .6 kilojoules here. Now I can then also use Hess's law and the absolute entropies that I have in a table, like appendix four, to calculate my delta S of my reaction. Again, that would just be products, minus reactants, you'd make sure to multiply by the correct number of moles for each of the products and reactants. Um, but then you'd come out with a change in entropy of 368 joules per Kelvin. And at this point, uh, once you have your delta H and your delta S, you can just plug these directly into your equation, like so. You'll notice that the temperature here needs to be in Kelvin, needs to be in Kelvin because your delta S is in per Kelvins, also just because Kelvin is an absolute measure of temperature, uh, where zero Kelvin is equal to uh, absolute zero. And then also make sure to watch your units. Oftentimes your delta S will be listed in joules, whereas your delta H will be listed in kilojoules. So here we'll be converting our delta H into joules, and then we just plug that into our calculator to get a, a value. Let's give you a little bit of practice calculating delta G this way. I want you to give me the delta G of this reaction where solid carbon in diamond form, which is its non-standard state, gets converted into its standard state of graphite. Now for this conversion, uh, I want you to figure this out at room temperature, which means 25 degrees Celsius, given this information from the back of your books. All right, go ahead and pause the video now and try and figure this out. All right, so what we have to do is calculate first our delta H. So our delta H is going to be equal to our heats of formation of our products, which is zero because graphite is in its standard state, minus our delta H of formation for our reactants. In this case, that's diamond. So it'd be zero minus 1.9. So we get a delta H of negative 1.9 kilojoules per mole. We'll do the same thing for calculating our entropy. The entropy of graphite is 5.7. The entropy of diamond is 2.4. So we'll take 5.7 minus 2.4. That'll equal 3.3. Then for calculating our delta G, we're just going to plug values in. The temperature, we use 25 degrees Celsius or about 298 Kelvin. So if we plug these values in, we should convert our 
delta S value to kilojoules. Make sure to do that. Now, why did I choose kilojoules this time instead of joules like last time? Well, because all my answers are in kilojoules. The real answer is it doesn't matter whether you're in joules or kilojoules, as long as your units match. Then we can add this up and we should find that we have a negative 2.88 kilojoules of Gibbs free energy in this equation or from this reaction. Now, what did we just calculate there? Well, we actually just figured out whether converting uh, diamonds to graphite is a spontaneous process or not. And we got a negative delta G value for this process, which means that this reaction is spontaneous. And at what temperatures is this diamond to graphite conversion spontaneous? Well, our delta H is negative, which means we have an exothermic reaction. Our delta S is positive, meaning we've increased the disorder of the universe. So it turns out that at all temperatures, the conversion from diamond to graphite is spontaneous. So are diamonds actually going to last forever? So this is actually a great question that brings up some very key points about this Gibbs free energy and what it actually tells us and what it doesn't tell us. So first off, our Gibbs free energy, having a negative Gibbs free energy, tells us that a process is spontaneous, but it doesn't actually tell us how long it'll take to happen. It doesn't tell us if the reaction is going to happen in a microsecond or if it's going to take 2 billion years to go, to go through. Also, just because a our process is spontaneous doesn't mean it's going to happen. Because remember, in chemistry, when we say spontaneous, we mean you have to get the reaction started and then it'll keep going on its own. So if you start turning, uh, if you start turning diamond into graphite, it will continue to go that way but it actually takes quite a bit of a push to get that reaction started. So don't worry, all of your diamonds are gonna be perfectly fine for your lifetime, for the lifetime of all your kids, um, and all the way down until the sun supernovas. Now, if we happen to make it out of this solar system by then, maybe your, your great, great, great grandkids will be disappointed that their diamonds turned into graphite, but I think you'll be fine with that scenario. All right. So. We said that we can get our delta G of our reaction from the delta H and delta S's, but you can actually get it one last way, and that's from delta G's of formation. So like our enthalpy and our entropy, our Gibbs free energy is actually also a state function. And so we can calculate our delta G of our reaction from our delta G's of formation for our products minus the delta G's of formation for our reactants very similar to how we do this for our delta H's uh, formation. So all we need is our delta G's of formation, but what are these free energies of formation exactly? Well, that's the same idea as a delta H of formation. We're just going to take elemental species to make the molecule of interest, and we're gonna do that under standard conditions. So our delta G of formation is just the delta G of a reaction, for the formation of a single mole of a compound from its elements in their standard states under standard conditions. And these, just like our delta H's are listed, or our delta H's of formation are listed in your book in appendix four. So let me just give you an example of how we do that. Let's say we've got this process where we've got NH4NO3 solid. We're gonna put this in water and it's gonna dissolve into NH4 plus and NO3 minus. How did I know it was being put in water? because it says aqueous right here, that means water. So all I'm gonna do here is sum up the delta G's of formation of my products minus my reactants. Notice in this equation, still you have to multiply by the number of moles in this reaction. In this case, there's a one for a coefficient for everything, so I don't really have to worry about it. So I'm just going to take my delta G of formation for NH4, which is 79.3, add it, to my delta G of formation for NO3 minus, which is negative 108.7. So I'm gonna multiply each of those by one mole. Then I'll subtract one mole times the delta G of formation of NH4 NO3 here, which is negative 183.9. I'll just get a value out from that, negative 4.1. Okay, so that's just about it for delta G. Now let's talk about how this plays out in biochemistry. It's actually pretty interesting and pretty relevant to everyday life. 
So living organisms, right, we need energy to do things. We need to be able to move. For our muscles to flex, that's going to take some amount of energy. For transporting things using little molecular motors or different uh, molecular processes, these are all going to take energy. Now, the problem with most biological processes is that most of them are not spontaneous. So you have to put energy into the system. You have to kind of drive the reaction. You have to push it forward. So how do we do that? How are we even alive if most of the processes in our body are not spontaneous and don't just keep going on their own? Well, the way we get around this is by coupling these reactions to non or coupling these non-spontaneous reactions to spontaneous reactions. So one great example of this takes place in what's called the glycolysis cycle. We're not going to go through the whole cycle. You'll get to do that once you get to biochemistry. But in glycolysis, what you take is glucose, or in one step, you take glucose and you add a phosphate to it. So in this OH sticking up up here, you're going to replace that hydrogen up there with this phosphorus group, and then you're going to get water off as another reaction. So this is actually a very important uh, reaction, and it lets us process sugars. So this glucose 6-phosphate molecule here is actually a really important uh, building block for further reactions that help power our body. The real big problem with this reaction, though, is it has a delta G value that is positive meaning it is not spontaneous. If it's not spontaneous, how do we get this to go? Well, it turns out a different reaction, the conversion from ATP to ADP. In this reaction, we said before that in this reaction, you're uh, losing, or this reaction takes heat to drive it, but it turns out that this reaction also uh, increases your entropy. And that works together to give you a delta G value that is negative. You'll notice this delta G value of going from adenosine triphosphate to adenosine diphosphate, wherein we're chopping off one of these phosphates, gives us a big negative value. So this is a spontaneous reaction. So if we take a phosphate from ATP, we couple this with the glycolysis cycle, we take that phosphate directly from ATP, give it to glucose, to get this glucose 6 phosphate. Well, then we've coupled one reaction that is spontaneous with one that's non spontaneous, and we end up with an overall spontaneous reaction. So we can add the delta G's of these two reactions together this negative 30.5 plus 13.8 to get a total of negative 16.7 kilojoules for this reaction. So this reaction has free energy to drive it and to push it forward. So you can couple two or even more reactions and together to get a spontaneous process out of some non-spontaneous process. All right, that is it for Gibbs Free Energy. Feel free to reach out and let me know if you have any questions. And with that, I would just like to thank you for being part of Chem 105 and say, school is out. <laughs>